Church. Today, we're going to be starting a brand new series. And as you might see, I'm in a different setting, but we're not going to let a different setting stop us from starting a new series. In fact, we're actually intentionally leaning into the limitation of this series by filming the entire series by iPhone. We're recording by iPhone, we're filming by iPhone, and I actually firmly believe that God can use what may seem like a restriction in our life to reveal something that we may often miss. And so I want to invite you to, to open your heart today. I want to invite you to really even open the chat and interact with some people as we kind of really begin this brand new series together as the church. And by opening the chat, you're going to feel like you're together. You're not feeling like you're on your own. And so let's get into it today and let's start this series by opening up to the book of Hebrews. If you have a Bible with you, Go ahead right now, open up to the book of Hebrews, and we're going to go straight to chapter 12. And for context, let's start in verse 1. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, now I got to pause right there because I feel like that verse, even though it's just trying to set the context of what we want to preach today, I feel like that verse could preach this morning. The fact that we are surrounded, even in a season where we feel isolated and alone, the truth is you're not alone. The truth is Jesus is always with you, but we're also surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses that have already run their race of faith and now are cheering us on and urging us on to really live the life of faith and to obtain the prize that is set before us. But that's not our focus today. It's just setting the scene for verse 2, which is going to be our series verse. Check this out. It says, verse 2, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wow, what a scripture and what a way to kick off a series. And Really to do that today with the first installment, I want to speak to you from a subject that I'm going to actually make a faith statement for us in our series. So, so if you're with somebody, I want you to prepare to tell them my, my sermon title. If you're on your own, prepare to write it in the chat right now. And I want you to make this faith statement together as the church. And this is our sermon title. You ready? The sermon title is, My Faith is fixed. Go ahead and tell that to somebody, write it in the chat right now. You can even emphasize it with a fist bump or a thumbs up or whatever you want to do, get creative. But I got to tell you, my faith is fixed. I'm in a boxing gym right now, if you haven't noticed, which might kind of seem like a strange setting to be bringing a sermon from, but really because nothing is normal in this season, we get to pick whatever setting we want to preach from. And today I chose a boxing gym. And honestly, I got to tell you, this, this setting ain't that strange to me. It's kind of familiar because growing up, man, I, I learned how to fight. I had three brothers, so fighting was a way of life. And, and I remember one time growing up, my mom would be so angry every time we'd fight as brothers. And I think one day she just flipped a switch and she kind of gave in to the fact that we're fighting and she bought us some, some boxing gloves. And I remember she came home with a couple of pairs of boxing gloves and she was kind of mad, but kind of had this weird look on her face where she said, all right, boys, if you're going to fight, fight with these. I think her plan was to make sure we didn't do any permanent damage in case one of us obviously would have been me is going to be a model when we grow up. She didn't want any permanent damage. And so she bought us some boxing gloves. I can remember being so excited with the brothers. I remember putting the boxing gloves on. And I remember when we stepped up to fight each other, Neither one of us wanted to throw the first punch. In fact, we, we did a lot of dancing around. We did a lot of chasing each other around. And I remember we threw a lot of punches, but none of them connected. And I can remember just after a couple of minutes of actually throwing punches that never connected, we were so tired from boxing that we couldn't even lift our arms. In fact, we, we quit boxing even before we could even connect one punch. And I remember there was no feeling I'd ever felt before more fatiguing than boxing. And maybe that was mum's plan. Maybe that was mum's plan all along to stop us fighting was to tire us out. But as I was reflecting on this, I began to wonder, I wonder how many people feel like that in the realm of faith right now. Where because you've gone rounds and you've had faith, 
but maybe what you believe for hasn't eventuated or maybe it feels like you've just been kind of dancing around this idea of faith. It feels like your faith is fatigued. Maybe it's not been before. I wonder, and maybe I could ask, how many people feel like that right now? Because truthfully, in a lot of the conversations that I've been having recently, this reoccurring statement keeps surfacing. In people who are in a moment of transparency and honest enough to admit it, what I keep on hearing is that my faith is fading. Like a fighter who's going round after round, what started out as strong is slowly beginning to fade. And maybe you started this season of isolation strong. Maybe you were pretty confident. Maybe you thought, man, I got this. I, I'm strong. I, I know God's got me. I know that God will work this out. This is not going to last too long. But now it's lasting a month, two months, and there is no sign of it ending. How's your faith feeling right now? Is your faith still strong? And truthfully, last year when we were planning this series, I could not have predicted that this timing would be as perfect as it would to start a series on faith. So, so let's do something at the beginning of this series. Let's spend a moment right from the beginning and build a base understanding of faith. And I think that a good place to begin really would be with a healthy description as we see here in Hebrews, because I feel like Hebrews could provide for us the best description of faith possible because what we find specifically in Hebrews chapter 11 in my opinion is possibly one of the clearest and most commonly used descriptions of faith in the entire Bible. It says now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. Now I gotta tell you I think I've heard that sermon or this scripture preached in so many different sermons and so many different settings and it's kind of one of those scriptures that when the preacher says it everybody just says amen but before you say amen, I wonder if we could possibly agree on something for a moment. I wonder if we could agree that not only is this one of the most commonly used passages of Scripture to describe faith, could we also agree that it's confusing, more than clear? Even as a Bible teacher, I kind of find this conflicting. Because on one hand, I love the fact that it describes or tells me that faith is something that is both substantial and evidential. I love that. However, on the other hand, it tells me that my substance is in things that are hoped for. And it's talking about our evidence being in things that are not seen. So how is that substantial and how is that evidential? So if anything, what it's describing is actually a faith as having a whole lot of tension. That's what it's talking about. In fact, maybe, maybe, we, could, maybe we could find this and we could define faith this way for a moment. Because, because I know that for me, I like faith statements like, like we find in Matthew chapter 17. You know, the mountain moving kind of faith where it says, even if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be moved and it will be moved. I mean, we all love that verse. We all love that expression of faith, this mountain moving kind of faith, specifically because it tells us how much God can do, that He can do a lot with just a little. But I wonder what happens when your faith can't even move your finances, let alone a mountain. Like maybe you're in a season right now where you have lost your job. And maybe at the beginning of the year, you had a job and what you were planning for with your finances this year was a vacation, but now you're simply trying to provide. And this is what can make faith really frustrating. When I thought I had the mountain moving faith, but I've kind of got more of a faith as confusing as Hebrews presents. A faith that feels like a fight, a faith that has a whole lot of tension to it. In fact, if I had unlimited time today, I would definitely base a lot of this talk around the tension that we experience in life. The fact that we live in tension. Even last weekend, Easter weekend, it was surprising to me how much one weekend can hold so much tension. I mean, we've got the tension of, of Good Friday and the crucifixion, and then we've got the tension of Sunday and its resurrection. We've got the tension between celebrating Jesus stepping out of the grave, and yet we're still stuck in our own situation. Even if we were to bring it back to a surface level for a moment, what, what about the tension that we have in this season where I know if you're like me, you have these grand ideas of spending time with your kids, but when it comes to spending time with the kids, all you want is just some silence to get some work done. There's tension. And truthfully, I feel like in life, we never ever escape the tension. In every season, what we can be sure of is an expectation of tension. And I believe that God is actually wanting to use 
some of those seasons that hold tension, believe it or not, to deepen our faith, which is possibly why the Apostle Paul presents it so bluntly to Timothy. You see, in, in 2 Timothy, we find a, a unique relationship on display and, and it's presented in a letter from Paul to his, really his protege, Timothy. Now, at the time of this letter, Timothy is a young man attempting to lead the church through some perilous times, which, you know what, I can really connect with. Maybe not in the young aspect, because, you know, truthfully, in a couple of months' time, I'm going to be 40 years old. I don't know how much longer I can hold on to the young man illustration. Maybe I need to find some middle-aged Bible characters that I can be inspired from. However, what we do know and what I can recognize with and what I can connect with is the tension between being convinced of your calling but yet being confused by your circumstances. You don't have to be a minister to, to connect with Timothy in that setting. We can all have a conviction of the calling of God in our life, but yet be so confused by the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And in a personal letter, not only does Paul bring so much needed encouragement to this young man in his timid season, more importantly, what we see on display in 2 Timothy is Paul bringing a healthy perspective around what faith really looks like. And in 2 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, he says this, he says, fight the good fight of faith. Now, this is interesting because he doesn't instruct him to stand firm or to just stand strong in the season that he's in. In fact, if I was in a turbulent season, if I was in a season that was unexpected, what I would expect is someone just to say, be strong, be steadfast like a rock. But but Paul knew something because he'd experienced life a little. Paul knew that faith is more like a fight. He knew that as a follower of Christ, what we can expect is unexpected seasons. What we can expect is uncertain seasons. What we can expect is that there is this turbulence to our life that we can't predict and we cannot foresee, but we can have an expectation of it. And though, and I thought that maybe we could use that understanding today to really begin to unpack for the first installment of this series and use it to deepen our understanding of how faith actually works in our life, this unexpected season. And I really feel like this is gonna help somebody today. And for the first thing we need to understand is we need to understand what it is we're fighting for. If you're taking notes, you can feel free to write that down. That's the first point. When it comes to the fight of faith, you need to know what it is that you're fighting for. You see, this faith fight is a fight for faith. <laughs> I can't put it any more simpler than that, that this faith fight that we're in is a fight for faith. What I mean is, and maybe I could put it this way, when you went to the fight of faith, what you need to know is your opponent. Because the enemy, he always works in specific ways. Our enemy that we fight against in the realm of faith, he works in the area of doubt and disbelief. What he does is he uses shame to, to really corner you into doubting your identity in Christ. And through condemnation, he will cause you to question the very validity of your calling. But knowing that our fight is for faith, it actually has this way of putting your situation in perspective. What do I mean by that? Well, I remember when we first started the church, Vibe Church. This is back when we were in the 40-person the conference room in the Crown Plaza in Palo Alto. And I can remember we'd set an atmosphere and we wouldn't even half fill the room. Like we'd have so few people turn up. But, but I remember one specific Sunday, a man came up to me after the service and he seemed well-intentioned and maybe he was seeming trying to just lighten my load as a pastor. But he said, why, you, why do you bother setting up the speakers and the microphone? Obviously, there's not enough people here to require it. And I can remember saying something really corny to him, but it was heartfelt, something really cheesy, like we might have tens right now, but I'm setting an atmosphere for thousands. And I kind of blush thinking about the fact that I actually said that, but, but yet it's, it is an expectation or really it's an example of what it looks like to fight for faith. That in seasons where there is so much discouragement around you, that optically what you can see around you may be, may be disappointing you, it may be discouraging you. You need to have a faith statement to your life that is like a counterpunch to faith because what we're fighting for is faith. We're fighting for a realm of faith and what the enemy is trying to do is he's trying to eradicate faith. He's trying to minimize faith. He's trying to take faith out of our life. But when the enemy comes with doubt, what you need to develop is a counterpunch of faith, a statement that 
that, that in many ways actually releases faith into the atmosphere of your life. And it was this, really, this, this was what was present in Timothy's life that Paul needed to illuminate in him that, that his fight was for one of faith. Timothy was timid and Paul needed to put faith in the atmosphere around his life. The second thing that Paul wanted his apprentice to know was what he was fighting from. Not just what he was fighting for, but it's just as important to know what you're fighting from. And this is a game changer, I gotta tell you this, because you see, Paul, he didn't just urge him to fight. He actually, in his letter, instructs him to fight the good fight. Now, after being in a lot of fights myself, because I had brothers, and my brothers wouldn't just get into fights, they would get me into fights, and I'd have to get them out of fights and fix their fights. What I have discovered over a life of fighting is what determines a good fight and a bad fight. And you know what I found out? What makes a fight good is the one that you win. It's that easy. If you win the fight, it was a good fight. And this is really the theme that Paul really carried through as an apostle in all his letters, specifically in his letters to the Roman church. We see it, he puts it on display here in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, where he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Which basically means this, that while a conqueror fights for victory, someone who is more than a conqueror, that means you and I, we fight from victory. We're not fighting for an outcome that we're uncertain about. We're fighting from a victorious place in Christ Jesus. And Paul wanted Timothy to know that too. He wanted Timothy to know that you are already victorious. So, so where Timothy is being timid, he tells him, fight the good fight of faith. He over, even goes on to say this, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you, were made your, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now don't miss this church, you need to see this. He says, take hold of the eternal life. Or in other words, he says, what lies ahead of you, use that as an anchor in your present season. Maybe I could say this more poetically. He, he, he was presenting this perspective to Timothy of, of being able to pull his future reality in Christ into his present pressure. And I don't want you to miss this because this is such a, a paradigm to understand that as believers, we already have a present reality in a future reality. That Christ already won victory for us when He went to the cross. And we have this understanding that Paul is presenting to Timothy and to us that even in seasons of uncertainty, that even in seasons where we're timid, we are able to draw on our future reality, our victory in Christ, and bring that into our current reality to produce a confidence in our life. In fact, if I was actually to bring it back to this moment here into the ring, what we can see here in, in the ring, we're in the ring right now, the boxing ring. And just being in this ring, I kind of feel like a champion, just something in the atmosphere, there's something in the air. And, and what we will know from being in the ring and what I've learned about boxing is throughout history, there have been many scandals in the boxing world as a result of this thing called match fixing. I don't know if you've heard about this, match fixing, where when a, a fight has been fixed, what it means is that someone has predetermined the outcome because someone's been paid off. Someone was paid to take a fall, which predetermined the outcome and they already knew about it. Now, now this was terrible for the support and for the sport and it's completely corrupt, okay? So I'm not advocating match fixing, but all that aside, just imagine for a moment being in that winning position as the one who was going to win the fight. And the kind of confidence that would come from already knowing that the fight is already won. Even before you step into the ring, even before you make one punch or take one hit, that you already win. And as random as this illustration may seem, I want to suggest that that's how our faith actually is meant to function. That our faith is meant to function from a place where we already know the outcome before we even enter the ring. But instead of our opponent being paid off, in our situation, he's already been defeated. You see, last weekend we celebrated Easter and we saw that Jesus, he, he, on, as He hung on the cross in His final moments, as He gave up His last breath, the Bible says that He spoke these words, It is finished 
which in reality for the enemy was sounding the knockout bell and winning victory for us as the enemy was defeated. And this is why the Hebrew writer, the writer of Hebrews right now in our series verse also makes this statement. He says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. What he was doing is he was articulating what Paul was trying to present to Timothy and what the writer of Hebrews is trying to present to us, that Jesus did the same thing. Jesus looked forward. He looked beyond the cross. He looked to the moment of victory and He used that as the joy set before Him, empowering Him to endure the present reality that wasn't so comfortable. A present reality that was actually uncertain. Understanding that Jesus also worked this way, that He looked forward and He brought a future reality into His present reality. Now I can understand being uncertain in seasons when I'm not sure of the outcome. Maybe you're in that season right now, this season that we're all in together where we're not sure of the outcome so that that uncertainty can produce an uneasiness in me. And I can definitely comprehend how uneasy it feels when you don't know the outcome. But when you work out that we win is when you realize that my faith is actually fixed. You see, my circumstance may be uncertain. My situation may be constantly changing. My environment might be turbulent, but what I do have is a faith that is fixed. My situation may be variable, but my faith is fixed. My circumstance may be unpredictable, but my faith is fixed. I'm trying to preach to somebody today who is so uncertain and doesn't know a way out, doesn't know a way forward, but But I do know that you can have an anchor in this season because your future reality is one in Christ Jesus, which fixes your faith in this season. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that your faith is broken, but I am trying to say that often our faith is misplaced because our faith tries to be in our in our ability to navigate a circumstance. We try and put our faith in our ability to make finances. We try and put our faith in our ability to make a way through un- uncharted and uncertain waters. But I got to tell you, God wants to fix your faith today. God wants you to fix your faith on the fact that we have victory in Him. And the same way that a fight can be fixed, meaning the outcome is already determined. I got to tell you, I'm getting excited in this boxing ring to tell you that God has fixed your faith the same way. You already win. So it doesn't matter what happens in this season. It doesn't matter in this season whether or not you feel like you're victorious or not. You are victorious in Christ Jesus. You are more than an overcomer in Him. And I want to tell you today, if you have been feeling uncertain, I want to pray for you. I I want you to fix your faith in Jesus. I want to help you get that faith so firm in your life that no matter what happens, the outcome of the season, how long this drags out, that you would find that there is a stability to your life. In fact, Jesus made this promise. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And in this season, what I want you to find is how to fix your faith in Him and find that you are not alone. Christ is with you. So right now, wherever you're watching this, all across the globe, I want you to do something. If you want to be included in this prayer, I want you to simply bow your head, close your eyes and open your heart. And there's nothing overly religious about closing your eyes, except it affords you the the opportunity to focus on Jesus. And I'm going to pray. God, I pray right now for each and every person that is praying this prayer. Lord, for every person right now that is acknowledging their need for you, that have felt uncertain in this season, that have felt uneasy in this season. But God, I pray, Lord, that there would be like a grounding of their faith in you right now. Lord, that as they profess their faith in you and as they set their faith in you, Lord, they would find a foundation to their life, Lord, that their faith would be fixed. And God, we pray that, Lord, your presence would permeate into that place. Lord, they wouldn't just hear words, Lord, they would feel your presence. They would feel your Holy Spirit. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Well, church. I hope that this ministered to you today. I hope this encouraged you in the area of your faith, that this faith is a fight, that this faith has this fight has some tension to it, to it in this life. And ultimately, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to welcome you to the family of believers. There are people all over the world connected to this ministry and connected to this family, and we want to welcome you into it. And I want to say this week, over this series, we're going to really explore different aspects of faith. But right here today, I want you to know this, your faith is fixed. Your faith is not fickle. Your faith is firm in Christ Jesus. God bless you.